Go ahead and apologize in advance for the uh, lackluster appearance of my film and blank sheets. I know that was not very good at film and blanks. <laughs> I, was sitting at, I was sitting in my house last night at 11 o'clock. I was like, oh no, he does film and blank sheets all the time. <laughs> all right, well, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I told uh, Scott last week, I said, I'm really glad you know you gave me a really easy easy book overview, you know, uh, Ecclesiastes. And he said, Well, if you want, we can just switch it, and then you can do Song of Solomon. And I was like, No, I'll do it with you. So we're in Ecclesiastes today. Um, go ahead and uh, let's pray, and we'll get started. <clears throat> Lord, thank you for uh, your word, the opportunity to gather and uh, study your word together. Pray this morning for us as we look at uh, Ecclesiastes, uh, a book that is realistic, that is uh, in many ways can be uh, depressing in some senses, um, but it gives us a realistic uh, outlook on what life is like uh, under the sun. <coughs> and so we just pray as we look at that, um, you would help uh, help us to lift our eyes from uh, from the world that we live in under the sun, and you would help us to, to look to you. And I pray that you receive much glory from our, our study today. Praise Christ's name. Amen. All right. So we're in Ecclesiastes. Um, I told, uh, I also told Scott last week that it's kind of like, you know, you go to a baseball game and, you know, the starting pitcher is just pitching pretty well. And then all of a sudden, like, you know, he hurts his arm or something and they have to call a bullpen and they call him that rookie that's not very good. And you're like, no, I just thought he had to go out. And that's what I feel like. I feel like the rookie from the bullpen. So, um, <laughs> So Ecclesiastes, so we're going to start, uh, we'll start with Ecclesiastes 1. Luckily for us, uh, Ecclesiastes is a little more, uh, a book that's a little more linear in terms of we can kind of walk straight through it a little bit uh, easier than some of the other books. Um, you know, if you walk straight through the Psalms, uh, you'd be here till you know, I was Scott's age. So um, it'll take you a while. But Ecclesiastes, we can kind of have a brief, uh, just a brief summary all the way through. So um, I wanted to start with some... Uh, some basic information on Ecclesiastes and uh, just some of the who's and what's that we're talking about. Um, so, first off, uh, I don't know exactly how Scott usually walks through. I've listened to a couple of his classes, but um, we'll start off with the author. So, uh, the author, you'll see Ecclesiastes 1, uh, verse 1. It says, the word of the preacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem. That word, uh, that word preacher there is actually uh, the Hebrew word kohelet. I think that's pronounced right. Q O H E L E T H. Um, basically, it just means preacher or teacher. Uh, and strictly speaking, um, it's not a personal title. That's just kind of a, a broad title that could uh, refer to any number of people. Um, so, strictly speaking, uh, the book of Ecclesiastes is anonymous. Um, now, when I say anonymous, I mean, it's not titled like what you're going to see in, uh, especially even in some of the Psalms, or um, usually you're going through your New Testament books and you'll see Paul, an apostle of, da, 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 da. Um, That's not uh, how Ecclesiastes starts. It kind of starts with this broad, uh, this broad anonymous author name. So, now with that said, um, historical tradition has uh, ascribed Ecclesiastes um, to Solomon. So, um, again, through Christian history, Solomon has been the one who has been usually uh, credited with writing Ecclesiastes uh, because he fits the description in verse 1 uh, the best, and then in various places throughout the rest of the book, um, some of the things that are described about the author, uh, those fit the categories of Solomon. So, now, with that said, right, there's always a, an asterisk. And with that said, some recent scholarship has kind of called this into question, uh, whether or not it's actually Solomon. Uh, there's a couple reasons for this. We're not going to get into them uh, too deeply today. Because um, realistically, it, it doesn't really matter that much um, if we know exactly who it is or not. Um, the, the truths hold, hold with regardless of who it is. Um, reasons that, some reasons that some people think Solomon might not be the author um, is just some of the timing. So some of the things that... Uh, some of the th things that uh, the writer, the preacher, is going to talk about in here, um, even the fact that there are many kings in Jerusalem before me, um, that he's seen wicked rulers in Jerusalem. Some of these things, people just think, oh, that, does, that doesn't necessarily fit the time frame 
of Solomon the best. So again, it's it's not a it's not a huge deal because all the major truth is going to hold fa uh, hold true. Um, but so strictly speaking, we're anonymous, um, and you can kind of fall into either one of the camps on whether or not it's it's Solomon or not. So all the vital truths are going to hold um, hold true regardless of of whether or not it's Solomon. So it's a great way to start, right? Well, again, we don't really know who wrote it. Right? Um, so that's kind of where we'll start with the author. Okay, the title. So um, I don't know about you guys, but I I have never once asked myself, I wonder what Ecclesiastes actually means. What's the word um, actually mean there? Um, Ecclesiastes comes from the Anglicized version of the Latin, um, the Latin Vulgate, which the, the title at the top of the Latin Vulgate um, was uh, Liber Ecclesiastes. That's how the, the Latin reads. Um, and it's derived from the Greek word uh, Ecclesiastes, or Ecclesiastes, or however you would pronounce it, so like that. Um, so we just anglicized that word uh, to make the title of Ecclesiastes. And that word, um, that word is just the Greek translation for the, the Hebrew word kohaleth. So the preacher is that, is that word translated. Uh, Ecclesiastes falls into the genre of wisdom literature. You guys have been in wisdom literature for a few weeks now um, with the Psalms and Proverbs. We'll wrap it up next week, I'm assuming, with Song of Solomon. And so as we read, uh, now, the different, one of the differences between Ecclesiastes and some of the other wisdom literature is that many times you'll, um, I'm sure when you talk about the Psalms or even the Proverbs, you would take uh, the teaching in, in kind of chunks. So whether it's uh, one Psalm altogether or a, a chunk of the Proverbs or have similar themes. Ecclesiastes, unlike those, like we were talking about earlier, can be studied linearly. So it kind of reads as a progression uh, you'll, you'll see here in a, in a little bit when we get started um, actually walking through the, the text. You'll see that the author will say, so I incline my heart to learn, da 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 And then I incline my heart to, da 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 And then I did this, and then I did that. And it's kind of a progression down, so you kind of see he's teasing out ideas as it goes, goes along. Ecclesiastes reads a lot more uh, like a journey, kind of following a guy's ideas. Uh, rather than kind of collected groups of wisdom, if that makes sense. So I'm um, just we're going to walk in a, in a minute. We're going to walk straight kind of through. It's not too terribly long, so we're going to be able to do that. But uh, you can you can study Ecclesiastes start to finish a lot easier than you can do that with some of the other wisdom literature. Does that make sense? Yes. Any questions before we get going into the uh, the actual chunk of the text? Okay. All right, so let's, uh, we're, we're going to go ahead and read verses 1 through 11 of uh, chapter 1. Um, we're, we borrowed the outline uh, from someone that uh, Scott said, I'm going to send you this outline, just make sure you reference who it is. And then I forgot to put who it is in the thing. So it's one of the guys he usually uses. Uh, so I borrowed this outline. I didn't make it up. <laughs> just for, for legal reasons, right? Uh, so let's read uh, Ecclesiastes 1, 1 through 11. And we'll kind of get some of the... Uh, this section is going to begin to encompass kind of all the ideas that, again, the author is kind of laying out his initial, uh, his initial idea, and he's going to just tease it out through the rest of the book. So you'll see a lot of the major themes uh, in uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. So let's go ahead and read it. Verse 1 says, The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, Vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What does a man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. Around and around goes the wind, and on its circuits the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. All things are full of weariness, a man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, see this is new? It has been already in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of former things 
nor will there be any remembrance of later things to come among those who come after. So we're going to start our Sunday morning with a very happy, you know, you know happy-go-lucky guy uh, who has a very, very good outlook on life, right? Uh, I had a conversation with Michael White a few weeks ago, and he kind of asked me. He said, "So, what are kind of the dynamics in your in your house? Like, you know, who's the who's the realistic one? Who's the optimistic one?" And I said, "Well, I, I kind of fall in the category of a pessimistic realist, right? So, I I, I like to think that everything is going to, you know, I know how everything's going to go, but I'm pretty pessimistic about stuff." Um, and he said, "Yeah, that's probably not good." And I was like, "Yeah, you're probably right. I don't know. You normally have a." very optimistic outlook on life. Um, but I think when I was, as I was reading through Ecclesiastes, I wrote through the whole thing in kind of one, uh, one sitting, and the preacher sounds very pessimistic, okay? You're going to read uh, one, chapter 1 through almost to the very end of the book, and you're just going to be depressed. It's like, oh, this, this might give this guy fun. He's not very happy. Um, or, and it, sometimes it can seem like uh, he doesn't have a very good outlook on life. Um, but I think what, what we've got to remember is that um, what the preacher is doing here is he's trying to set up to give people a proper outlook on how to view the world, how to look out into uh, the world that they see and make sense of it. Now, one of his main points later on is going to be that you can't make sense of it because it's random and time and chance happens to everyone. Um, but he wants to say, okay, I'm looking out at the world and I'm trying to find what's the meaning of life. Why am I here? What am I, what's the purpose? How can I find uh, satisfaction in life? So um, what may seem like pessimis pessimism in these first 11 verses uh, actually uh, is just him going ahead and giving us an initial uh, concept of where he's going so that as he's bringing up topics later on, you're not surprised by them. Like, what, where, where did that come from? And he kind of lays it all out. So there are five, uh, I think there are five, yeah, five key themes kind of we get from these first 11 verses. Um, so if you've got your fill-in-the-blank sheet again, apologies for how poor that fill-in-the-blank sheet is. But um, the first theme that we see kind of starting in chapter 1 is this, this theme of vanity, right? So if you've ever studied Ecclesiastes or you've heard Ecclesiastes preach, um, you've probably heard uh, chapter 1, verse 2 quoted, right? Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Talk about depressing, right? That, that literally means meaningless of meaningless, says the preacher. Meaningless of meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Okay, we're going to see later he bookends chapter 12 uh, with the same phrase. So it's kind of like he's going to give us a bunch of uh, descriptions of what life is like. Bookended by this idea that everything's meaningless. Nothing really matters anyway. Uh, which is, you know, again, a really, really happy idea. This word vanity is the Hebrew word habel, which... Uh, it's translated here, vanity, it also means vain. Um, in, other, in other uses, it's used to uh, conjure this idea of a, a mist or a vapor. So um, you guys know what it's like when you have a candle and you blow it out, and then the, the smoke kind of rises, and you see it for a minute, and then it dissipates, and you don't see it anymore. That's kind of what this term, uh, this term means um, in, some other, in some other ways it's used metaphor. Metaphorically, it can mean just fleeting or elusive, and you can't, you can't grip hold of it, you can't grab it. And again, if you read all the way straight through Ecclesiastes, this is the word you're, you're probably going to leave remembering, vanity. Okay? So he's going to give you a, a, a topic, and he's going to say, and then I figured out it was all vanity, it was all worthless, meaningless. And he's going to give you another topic, and then I saw that this was vanity, it was all meaningless, it was all worthless. And so he, again, he starts his idea with vanity of vanity, says the preacher, vanity of vanity, all is vanities. So, you know, Bible study 101, if a word is repeated over and over, you should probably look at it because it's important. Well, some verses, there's one word, word and that's the whole verse, which is verse 2. And again, he bookends um, chapter 12 with that as well. And then he's going to give us just a very brief solution at the end uh, to what do we do with the fact that everything is vanity. So, key theme number one is vanity. Uh, secondly, you see in verse 3, he said, what does a man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? Okay, this word toil shows up in verse 3, and it's going to uh, it's gonna set up this fundamental idea of the way uh, the preacher views life, in that it's work. Right? It's 
hard. It's not easy. Like anybody else in here feel like life is not easy sometimes? There are struggles. Um, you have to work hard to do things. Uh, this word, in many ways, is going to be the word that kind of grounds all the other things he's talking about. Uh, because uh, he's gonna, he says he looks out at life and sees that it's a struggle. Regardless of what your socioeconomic status is, what your background is, what you do for a living, uh, where you live, yada yada. Regardless of your circumstances, uh, life is full of toil for people on earth. So we're going to see it in a minute. Under the sun is going to be his next theme. But for people who live under the sun or live on earth, uh, life is full, full of toil and strife. Again, verse 3, again, the next. So toil is the next, is the second theme. Third theme is this, this term under the sun. Okay, so uh, I think one of the reasons that, that the preacher uses this word is he wants us to know he is looking just horizontally out. Right? He doesn't have his eyes lifted to anything above and any, any kind of spiritual realm. It's on earth, uh, looking out at the physical world, the world that he lives in uh, under the sun. So what does the man give with all the toil which, which he toils under the sun? You know, as we go on, you'll see that he says a lot of times, uh, I, I, I sought to find wisdom under the sun, or uh, I, I attained many possessions under the sun. And this idea of under the sun makes you, makes you realize, um, by the end of the book, what you'll realize is that um, you spent, it's kind of one of those things that um, the longer you do something, you kind of get unaware that you're doing it, right? So he's just going to keep saying under the sun, under the sun, under the sun. And by the end of the book, um, sometimes you'll just be like, of course, under the sun, why do you keep telling me this? And you'll just forget it. Well, then at the end, right, I'm going to go ahead and spoil it. At the end, he's going to tell you to lift your eyes out from under the sun to something above the sun. And you're going to be like, oh, wow. Yeah, I have been focusing on what's around me in the world around me for the whole the whole progression of the book. And he's going to, um, he's going to start walking through uh, these kind of solutions to what, how do we find value? How do we find satisfaction in life under the sun? So uh, one of the great things I love about Ecclesiastes is this, it's super relevant. Right? So everyone that you bump into is looking for the question to, well, how do I find satisfaction in life under the sun? Now they might not phrase it that way. But that's a question that everyone's asking. What is, what is my life? Why am I here? What am I doing? How do I find satisfaction in life? Why am I always disappointed uh, by the things that happen to me in the world? Why does my work never fully satisfy me? Why do, does relationships never fully satisfy me? And everyone's asking the question, what's the point of life under the sun? And so when the preacher is talking about uh, going through and talking about all these things that happen uh, under the sun, he's wanting us to realize, he's trying to answer the question for you of what life, what life uh, where do you find meaning in life under the sun? So under the sun is the third kind of theme. Let's get down to verse 9. You'll see the fourth kind of major theme that you're going to see. Uh, in, in Ecclesiastes. It says, what has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done. This is the theme right here. And there is nothing new under the sun. So nothing new. That's the, that's the fourth major theme you're going to see all the way through Ecclesiastes. And again, there's nothing new under the sun. So in the world around us, there is nothing new. Everything kind of has this cyclical nature that uh, things happen, and then we forget about them. And then they happen again, and then we forget about them, and then they happen again, and we forget about them. That's kind of the nature of, of life. Uh, in many ways, uh, I think the preacher is trying to teach us that life is not unexpected. Now, unexpected things happen. He's going to mention that later. But we shouldn't be surprised at anything, really, because the things that happen to us are merely expressions of the same kinds of things that have happened over and over and over uh, throughout all of history. This is one of the most difficult things, I think, for, for men to do, is that we have a hard time kind of zooming out from our own, you know, how many years we have on earth, and thinking back to things that have happened before. Right? We're not very good at, at history. Right? So when we, uh, we see something terrible happen, we say, oh my gosh, how did that happen? And then we forget that the same type of things have happened in the past over and over and over. And that's what the preacher is trying to kind of uh, kind of instill in us as we 
uh, look through this. I like the way that he, the way he kind of frames this idea of nothing being new is he uses the natural world, right? So this is kind of a guy, you know, I'm picturing him like sitting out, just like watching the weather, okay? He says, in verse five, the sun rises and the sun goes down. So again, every day it goes up and it goes down. And it goes up and then it goes down every day, right? Same thing, nothing new. The wind blows to the south and blows to the north. The wind patterns. Today, when we have a uh, even more in-depth view of science and how you know, the natural ecosystems work, right, this is true. Right? We see patterns of wind where wind keeps going the same ways. Um, we were watching a show yesterday. Um, I don't know, it's one of those random shows that's on in the morning on Saturdays. It's where they like, rescue the sea turtle. Okay, and they have to take it back to the same place where the sea turtles usually go because they always go in the same loop. Right? That's how their migration patterns go. Right, same loop, same things. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. Right? So the water cycle proves to us that nothing is new under the sun. Right? Uh, I can't remember, I, I looked it up, I forgot to write down. Something like millions and millions and millions of gallons of water evaporate every day for the sole purpose of falling back so they can run back. So they can evaporate again so they can fall back so they can run back over and over and over. Right? So he uses this idea of even, even in the natural world, even in the, the way that it, it rains or the way that water runs through the sea, nothing's new. Right? It's, it's all the same. It's all the same. He's going to, again, he's using that as this kind of a, a, a basic example that he's going to tease out later as well. And then the fifth theme we see here in verse 11, chapter 1, there is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after. So if all this wasn't depressing enough, right, your life is just kind of the same things over and over doesn't really have any any meaning under the sun. You're gonna have to work hard. And, you know, you're not really gonna. You're gonna struggle to find meaning. Then he's gonna just put the, the cherry on top and say, and then once you're gone, nobody's gonna really remember that you were here anyway. Right? Everybody's gonna forget you. Everybody's gonna forget all the things that you did. And then even the things that are gonna happen after you, people are gonna forget those as well. Nobody's gonna really remember uh, the things that were before you or after you. Right? So uh, when I talk about a pessimistic realist, right? There you go. He's got a, uh, a seemingly pessimistic view on life. But what he's trying to tell us, what he's trying to show us, is that the problem with life is that everything seems meaningless. Everything is meaningless. That's the, that's the problem he wants to, to establish. So any questions before we move on from that? We've established kind of why, I mean, why is Ecclesiastes even written? It's to, to point out a problem. Then we're gonna, he's going to give us some proof to why that problem is real, and then and then we'll find the solution at the end. Any questions? Yeah. No. Number five. What is it? Um, is so there's no remembrance. No remembrance. Yep. Okay. No one remembers. That was the fifth thing. Again, these are going to come up. Uh, what he's going to do? He kind of gives us the basics right here. Then he's going to again tease that out into certain categories. So he'll say, I've got a lot of possessions. We've seen that I got a lot of possessions, but they didn't really fulfill me. Right? I had to work hard to get all these possessions that I could, so I could have them under the sun. Right? But then I figured out all the stuff that I had, people have had before me, it's not really anything new. And then once I'm gone, everybody's going to forget me. I'm going to have to give it away to somebody else anyway. And that's how he's going to work through all of these, all of these different categories. So, life is meaningless. The problem, we see that in chapter 1, uh, verses 1 through 11. Okay, so next, like any good, uh, any, you know, good teacher, he's going to give us the proof to why his problem is is the right problem to ask, and we're going to see vanity in certain categories. Okay, so when you're, uh, if you're going to be the kind of teacher that says, "Hey, your life's meaningless, and nothing's new under the sun," you're going to have to work hard, and nobody's going to remember you. You better give me some proof to all that, right? Because that's really depressing. So uh, we'll see here. He goes through. I think there's four, uh, four different uh, uh, proofs that he has. The first is in uh, verses 12 through. Uh, 18 of chapter 1, and it's the vanity of wisdom. Right? That's the, I think that's the blank that you have, the vanity of wisdom. Now, it may seem odd to you that uh, in a book that falls into the category of wisdom literature, of someone who will later say, I've attained more wisdom than anyone in all of Jerusalem, right? that he would say, having wisdom is vanity, right? it's meaningless. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, I think one of the things he means is that um, even to the wisest of men, everything doesn't always make sense, right? So we know this, right? Um, you know, 
to the people we would think of as most wise in our life, they're caught off guard by things. We see in verse 15, what is crooked cannot be made straight, and what is lacking cannot be counted. All right? I always thought that verse should be the other way. Right? That, that, no, what God has made straight can't be made crooked. Well, it's the other way as well. Sometimes things that look, uh, look wrong, the things that are crooked, can't, we, they can't be made straight. They don't make sense. Or uh, in verse 18, he basically says wisdom is a bottomless pit. So the more that you find wisdom, the more you realize you need more wisdom. Okay? For in much wisdom is much vexation, and he who increases in knowledge increases sorrow. So, okay, well, here you go. So the basic way of saying is the more you know, or the, the more wisdom you have, the more you realize you need, and the more it makes you upset at the way that you don't have enough wisdom. Right? Again, the cyclical nature of life. So the vanity of wisdom. Okay? Second vanity he goes after, chapter 2, is the vanity of pleasure. So chapter 2, he's going to run through a list of all these different things that he's acquired over his life. It's material possessions, it's uh, relational, pleasure, relational pleasures. This is a list that I think if, uh, you know, if we are... If we are in, living in this time period, we'd all be kind of happy to get, right? So um, he's, you know, asserts how to cheer my body with wine and how to lay hold on folly. I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards. I made myself gardens and parks and planted all kinds of trees, right? I got singers, both men and women, to the delight of the children of man. I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. So I've, I've gotten more than anyone else has uh, ever had. And then we see in verse 11, he says, he says this, Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil, there's the word again, I had expended in doing it. So I realized all the stuff I had and all the hard work that it took me to get it. And behold, all was vanity and a striving after the wind. And there was nothing new to be gained under the sun. You see how our themes show back up? Right? I, I noticed all the things I had, all the toil that I had, all was vanity, striving after wind, nothing to be gained under the sun. Under the sun. I love this, this picture of striving after the wind. It's like, okay, how do you catch the wind? Right? When you're running after it, and it just keeps blowing. There's no way to catch it. That's the picture that he uses there. So the vanity of pleasure. So he's also, he said the vanity of wisdom. The next one is the vanity of living wisely. So not just having wisdom, but actually being able to practically put your wisdom to use. Um, so, being wise is better than being a fool, but there's a problem, is that the same end comes to both the wise man and the fool. Okay, verses 15, chapter 2, then I said in my heart, what happens to the fool will happen to me also. Why then have I been so wise? Right? And I said in my heart, that this is also vanity, for of the wise as of the fool there is no enduring remembrance, seeing that in the days to come all will have been long forgotten. How the wise dies just like the fool. Okay? So the wise person and the fool both die and they're both forgotten. So even living wisely in the end doesn't bring ultimate fulfillment because you can live as wisely as you want, but the same thing is going to happen to, to the fool that lives uh, down your street. Right? Okay? And then lastly, the fourth one, uh, before we get to chapter 3, Another example, he says, uh, the vanity of toil. So again, this, this idea of toil again. So, you know, I, I kind of feel bad for the guy because he seems, you know, really down all the time. Because he said, I hated all my toil in which I toiled under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me. That's verse 18. So he's saying, I'm working so hard to get all, this, all these things, to do all this work. And then... He just says, I just hate doing all this work because I have to leave it to somebody after me. You know, all those stuff that I work for, I'm not even going to get to ultimately keep with me forever. Right? I, have to let, I have to let it go to someone who is behind me. And then verse 19, right? This is the worry of all, all people in terms of their, uh, uh, their inheritance, what they're going to give to their families. And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool. Yet he will be master of all for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. Right. So, you know, we, we work and work and work, and then we have to leave our stuff to someone else, and they might just be cool and lose it all. And they won't remember us, right? That's kind of what he's saying. So those are the four kind of proofs that he gives us 
Alright, so uh, the vanity of wisdom, the vanity of pleasure, the vanity of living wisely, and the vanity of toil. So again, we're, we're, we're kind of teasing out these ideas. Then we get to chapter 3. Right? This is probably, again, if you've, if you've ever been around people who are talking about Ecclesiastes, a lot of times it's in the context of a funeral. And chapter 3 is the uh, kind of passages that are usually used uh, many times in uh, that. So we're going to read chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. Okay? And this is going to kind of give you a balanced, he's trying to take a balanced view of, of life. It says, for everything there's a season and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down, a time to build up, weep, laugh, mourn, dance, cast away stones, gather stones, embrace, refrain from embracing, seek, lose, keep, cast away, tear, sow, keep silence, speak, love, hate, war, peace. And he kind of walks through and says, for all these things, there's a, there's a time under heaven for all these things. Now, this section is really, in a lot of ways, it's really morbid. Like, yeah, there's a time to die. So if you just read the negative sides of what he's saying, right, life, life sounds really depressing, right? There's a time to die, a time to pluck up, a time to kill, a time to break down, weep, mourn, right? A time to lose, cast away, a time to tear, keep silent, a time to hate, a time for war. I mean, that sounds pretty, pretty downcast, right? And many of, many of us go through life trying to avoid all of the negatives that he says here at all costs, right? We, have, we try to just avoid the negative things that he's talking about. Now, you know, that, that's not necessarily bad. Uh, the problem is, is that we don't have control over those things. That's one of the things that uh, the teacher is trying to tell us about life is that we don't, there's a time for everything under heaven and we don't, we don't have control over it. So it's, as much as I would like for everyone to always avoid war, I don't have control over that. That's not, I, I'm not sovereign. I don't have control over all of my life on earth. And um, I think what he's wanting to do in chapter 3, he's wanting to, he's kind of told us that our lives are, are meaningless. And now he's wanting us to look at the fact that we are mortal. Right? That we're going to die one day. That we're not going to always be. That there's going to be some time where uh, our, our days are up. And the reason he does that is so that he can get us to uh, verses 9 through, uh, 9 through 15. So, verse 9. What, has, what gain has the worker from all his toil? I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. And I think here's, here's the point of why he just said all those things in chapter, in chapter 3, 1 through 8. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart. Yet so that he had, cannot find out what God has done from beginning to end. So you should look at that list in uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 8, and realize that God is in control of all of this. Right? God's not, it's not outside of God's sovereignty when these things happen. And they should make you think, there's got to be something more to life than this. Right? Than just this you know, back and forth between some good things happening some days and some bad things happening uh, the next. He's put eternity in the man's heart. Yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from uh, beginning to end. Then verse 14, I can see that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. So again, he's trying to uh, make us remove ourselves from this place of control in our life. And tell us not everything that happens to you in life is going to be under your control. And that's just part of life uh, under the sun. That you don't have control over the things that happen to you. Okay, so that's the, those are the proof, right? the proof that he's given us uh, for this problem of life being meaningless. Now, for the rest, kind of the rest of the book up until the very end, he's going to go through and uh, just give us some examples of what life is like in a meaningless world. Okay, what um, what does it look like to have to live in a world where where all is meaningless, have to live under the sun? Okay, so we're just going to walk through these. Uh, Kind of chapter 4 on through chapter uh, 11, they kind of just run through these different ideas of, of what life is like under the sun. Okay? So I think the first, uh, the first column, or the first blank under life in a meaningless world, and I'm not good at filling the blanks, so y'all can stop me from wrong. But the first one is that evil and oppression run rampant in life under the sun. Okay, we see this in verse, chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Again, I saw all the oppressions that are done under the sun. 
And behold, the tears of the oppressed, and how they had no one to comfort them. Okay, it's evil. I don't think you know, I need to really go in and prove this to you now. But in every culture of all time, there has been evil. Okay, evil and oppression has run rampant. Since the fall, yeah, evil has evil has been here. We see it also in chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. He says, if you see in a province the oppression of the poor and the violation of justice and righteousness, do not be amazed at this matter. For the higher official is watched by a higher, and yet there are higher ones over them. Okay, so don't be amazed at the fact that there is no justice in your land. Don't be, don't be amazed at the fact that uh, fairness, right, that uh, the rights of the poor and the poor are oppressed. Don't be surprised at that because it's new. It's not new. It's common. Okay, the second one. Uh, the second blank under there is that satisfaction is impossible to find in life under the sun. Okay, you see this in chapter 5, verse 10. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This is also vanity. Right, so, so you can't find satisfaction in your possessions. Uh, chapter 6, verse 1 through 6. There's an evil I've seen under the sun, and it lies heavy on mankind. A man to whom God gives wealth and possessions and honor, so that he lacks nothing of all he desires. Yet God does not give him the power to enjoy them, but a stranger enjoys them. And so even when we, we get things, we can't properly enjoy them. So satisfaction is impossible to find. Third blank, life is cyclical and repetitive. So the same things happen over and over and over. Again, we've kind of talked about this already. Chapter 6, verse 10 to 12. Whatever has come to be has already been named, and it is known what man is, and that he is not able to dispute with one stronger than he. So again, he kind of gives an example that the same kind of things happen uh, over and over. Move on to chapter 7. Uh, uh, life in a meaningless world includes that mourning is common. <clears throat> So it is better to go to the, chapter 7, verse 2, it is better to go to the house of mourning than go to the house of feasting. For this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay, lay it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by sadness of face the heart is made glad. Okay, mourning is common, and there's a place for uh, mourning in a meaningless world. Just kind of skim on to chapter 8. It says that judgment is not swift. You see this in chapter 8, verses 10 to 13. Then I saw the wicked buried. They used to go in and out of the holy place and were praised in the city where they had done such things. This is also vanity. <coughs> because the sentence, against an, the sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily. The heart of the children of man is fully set to do evil. So because we don't get immediately repaid for the things we do, we just keep doing bad things. Right? That's kind of how life works. Now you'll see in chapter 12, he's going to say, uh, one of the reasons that we should look outside the sun because God will bring every deed into judgment. But life in a fallen world means it doesn't happen quickly. Right? You don't immediately get punished for the things that you do. Now that's good for us because if we got immediately punished for the things we do, right, we have no hope. But God will bring everything into judgment. And so what some people take, so Christians take that to mean okay, we're not repaid for our deeds so we should look to Christ while we still have opportunity to repent. Others say I'm not repaid for my deeds so there's no there's no reason not to keep doing more evil. Right? You kind of see, you, you know, turn on the news and you'll see evil things just kind of snowball. Because people say, well, I didn't get caught for that. Uh, I didn't get caught for that, so maybe I won't get caught for the next thing. And I didn't get caught for that. Pretty soon they're into deep trouble. So judgment is not swift. Uh, verse 14 of chapter 8, kind of hand in hand, people are not repaid according to their deeds. All right? So um, this is kind of the idea that, that good things happen to bad people in a fallen world. <coughs> under the sun and bad things happen to good people and so that's not always the question why is there such a good, good person why did that happen to them well in life in a fallen world I would see that, that people aren't repaid according to their deeds just because you're a good person doesn't mean good things are necessarily going to happen to you all the time there's vanity that takes place on the earth that there are righteous people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked and there are wicked people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous okay so so there are wicked people to whom things happen that should happen to righteous people. And there are righteous people to, to whom things happen that should happen to wicked people. That's just part of life under the sun. Chapter 9, verse 3. And again, we're skimming way through this. So 
please go back and read. There's a ton more here. We're just kind of picking out some highlights. Chapter nine, verse three, we find that life is unpredictable. There's an evil that is done of the sun, that the same event happens to all. Also the hearts of children of man are full of evil, and madness is in their hearts while they live, and after they go to the dead. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing, and they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Life's unpredictable. Things happen that you can't, you know, you can make a great 30-year plan, right, so that you can retire at 65 and have a really nice life. Things happen that, you know, stuff happens. That's unpredictable in life or the sun. Chapter 9, verse 11, we find that there are no sure outcomes in life. Again, I saw that under the sun the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor the bread to the wise, nor riches to the intelligent, nor favor to those with knowledge. But time and chance happen to them all. Okay? There are no sure outcomes. You can go uh, to school for years and years and years and think you're going to get a really great job and not get it. Right? You can save and save and save and save and save, and then something happened and all your money, and the stock market crash, and all your money be gone. Right? You can pay and pay and pay and pay and pay on your house, and then you pay it off, and then your house <coughs> burns down. I mean, it's, that's just life under the sun. It's unpredictable. There are no sure outcomes. We can plan. Now, I think, again, one of the parts of going through this pretty fast, is there are places in Ecclesiastes where it says, it's better to live wisely than to live foolish. So just because things don't make sense doesn't mean you just should just go do whatever you want. But even if you do go live wisely, there's no sure outcome. And then chapter 10, verse 5 through 7, those in high places are not righteous. So even the leaders, so even if we're like, okay, well, let's just get a good leader. Once we get a good leader, then everything will be great. Well, no, it's not. Because even people in high places are not righteous. See that in chapter 10, verses 5 through 7. So, kind of got all the way through. Those are just some examples of a meaningless life under the sun. So, toil and strife under the sun. Nothing's new. No one remembers former things. And then there are these, these just examples of what life is like in a fallen world. So, that said, let's look at chapter 12, verse 8. And hopefully it's going to ring a bell to you. Chapter 12, verse 8. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher. All is vanity, right? Again, nice bookends of the same phrase that he used in chapter 1, verse 2. To say, look, all throughout your life under the sun, right? even if you live really wisely, even if you are a you know, quote-unquote good person, you will eventually realize that all is worthless. So chapter 12, verse 8 says, Vanity of Vanity says the preachers all is vanity. So how do we get out of this cycle of a meaningless life? How do we find any meaning or satisfaction in life? How do we keep from just being driven into depression and despair about the state of the world around us? Now, I'm sure that most of you guys have had experiences in your life where you've looked around and been like, why, why do I even do the things I do? Like, why do I get up and go to work every day? Why do I, you know, why do I parent my children this way? Why do I save for retirement this way? Why do I do the, all the things uh, that I do? And the, I think we ask those questions, but I think the main question that we always ask is, why, why am I living? Why am I alive? Why am I here? And why is it that even though I'm trying to find meaning in life, I can't find it in anything under the sun? That's the point that the preacher wants us to get to in Ecclesiastes where we've exhausted all of our, op our options of life under the sun in itself having meaning and having to find something else uh, apart from that to uh, have to give us meaning. So chapter 12 uh, says verse 9 and 10. So this preacher continued to give uh, wisdom. Then he says this in chapter 12, verse 11. He says, The words of the wise are like goads, and like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. My son, beware of anything beyond these or make, of making many books. There is no end, and much study is weariness of flesh. I told Mike when I read chapter 12, and I just decided I'm not going to write my novel because, you know, of making many books, there's no end. So no one's going to read it anyway, right? It's all vanity. But chapter 11, or verse 11 of chapter 12, I think uh, he tells us there's two things, right? Living wisely is better than living foolishly. The words of the wise are like goes. This is um, this. 
I didn't know what goad was, so I didn't look it up. And it's actually a uh, stick that you use to keep oxen in their kind of plowing lanes. All right, so think about that. So your life is kind of like an, an ox, and you just kind of got to, I mean, ox, they just walk and plow all day. Is that not what life feels like to us sometimes? That we're just kind of same thing over and over, we walk and plow? And wise words can be like a goad or just a stick that kind of keeps us from veering off, you know, into our neighbor's plot of land. Wise words can help you keep on the, the proper path, or it also says they're like nails firmly fixed, right? meaning they're, they're solid. So uh, in some ways, the, the words of the, of the wise person, or the words that we find here, are going to be the one solid thing we can kind of hold on to uh, under the sun. But then verse 13 and 14, they're going to give us kind of the big answer, right? They're going to give us the answer to why life under the sun is vanity. The end of the matter, the, the end of the matter, all has been heard. Verse 13, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment and with every secret thing, whether good or evil. So the reason why life under the sun is vanity is because in order to have a life that is not Vanity, you have to look outside the sun. You have to look to God because to fear God and keep His commandments is the whole duty of man. So you have to look outside of the natural laws that govern uh, the world and look to look to God and His commandments. So as you're reading Ecclesiastes, it's one of those things that you just kind of read it and you get more and more down the more and the more you read it. And that's on purpose. It's so that when you get to chapter 12, you get to the end, and he kind of says, hey, but here's the answer. Right? Don't look to life under the sun for your ultimate satisfaction. The, the whole duty of man, what, why you're here, why you're living, is to fear God and to keep his commandments. Because he will bring every deed into judgment. Meaning there is, uh, you know, on, on life in the fallen world, judgment is slow. It doesn't come how we think it should. God will bring ultimate judgment, and it, it will be the way it should be. All these things that we see about life in the fallen world... Uh, God is the one who will reverse those things. God is the one who will make those make sense. One day, when we when we look outside the sun, God will make all of those things new. So that's a brief kind of run through of Ecclesiastes. Again, we skip through a ton of stuff. Yes. At the end, what were the blanks like? Are the number four? Why is living is not your life? Uh, why is living is not? It is. Number yeah, four. I'm not good at. Um, Oh, wise living is not ultimate, but it is helpful. Thank you. It is helpful in a fallen world. Thank wise living, it's not going to ultimately give you fulfillment, but it will help you. Thank it, you. Is, it is helpful. So I know that was really brief. Again, we're trying to, you know, this is one of those things you think of like a, um, oh, what are they called? Not a nun, but a monk. You know, they kind of sit around, they just think all day. That's what, at least that's what I monks do. I don't know. I'm not really but then they're like, they just think on these deep things all day long, all day long. Well, you know, we're trying to do that in 40 minutes, what it would take them a couple years to do. So um, we skim through this. So please go back and read Ecclesiastes. And then if you have any questions, just make sure you ask Scott next week. He's a lot more than me. All right. So, all right, well, let me pray for it and we'll, we'll be done. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the uh, opportunity to study it. And we, we pray you help us to look um, not to the life under the sun, but to you. Pray that you help us to fear you, keep your commandments, uh, and to know that one day you will come. Uh, to judge the world, and, and that would uh, give us much hope that life is not in vain, um, that we can we can look to you for our purpose and fulfill the present Christ's name. Amen.